Well, our Christmas Compass magazine announced my guests coming, and uh, I have emails from people whose lives have been transformed. Others uh, who have some theological beefs with quotes and page numbers from the shack. It has become a phenomenon topping the New York Times bestseller list for 27 weeks in a row with 4.4 million copies sold. The author is a Canadian and it really is a joy to welcome Paul it's, Young. It's great to be here, thank you. You've really come from Oregon. Uh, Oregon. Or Oregon, yes. You know what, every time I get that wrong. That's okay, it just shows that you're a foreigner. It's like Calgary is, and Calgary is Calgary. That's exactly right, so it's Oregon and that's thank where you. I live now with my wife and my family, six children, a couple grandbabies. Yeah. You are originally from? I'm born in Grand Prairie, Alberta. I'm still a Canadian citizen. Good to hear. Yeah, you bet. And uh, um, I grew up overseas. I grew up uh, in the highlands of uh, uh, central interior New Guinea um, on the west side, not the PNG side. And then uh, we came back. I went to a lot of schools before I graduated high school. My father was an itinerant uh, preacher. And then, uh, um, so I went to high school in BC. I did some college in Saskatchewan, worked up in the Syncrude projects in north, north of Edmonton, up past Fort McMurray up there. You did Bible college. Yeah, yeah, in and Saskatchewan, seminary. yep. Uh, seminary work in, uh, in Oregon. Downside. And so I was on my way to Los Angeles to do some more education, ran into a group of people and figured, uh, I'm at a crossroads, I need to hang here for a bit. And I've been there ever since. Met my wife there and end of story, so. Well, it is your wife, Kim, who encouraged you yes. to write this book. Yes. What was she, behind she'd been, that? She'd been after me for a few years. I'm, I'm a writer in the sense that I've always written as gifts for family and gifts for friends, and, but I've never tried to publish anything in my life. That's why I say I'm an accidental author. Um, and this was no different. She had, she'd asked me, someday would you just write a, a, a gift for the kids, putting your thoughts, how you think in one place, because you think sort of outside the box. I think that's part of the missionary kid background. And um, she said, um, uh, if you could do that as a gift for the children, and that's what I was trying to do in 2005. I was no fine. intent on publishing. Oh, not at all. It wasn't even on the radar. I've never thought about publishing anything. And so the first run of the shack, the only intended run of the shack was 15 copies at Office Depot a little after Christmas 2005 for my family, a couple friends, a couple relatives, and uh, I was done. The book did everything, the story did everything that I wanted it to, uh, to do, but it was Kim that was the, the motivation behind it. Uh, she told me a couple months ago that she was thinking four to six pages. <laughs> Something the children <laughs> could absorb. How well, my, my youngest is 15, my oldest is 28, so we're not talking like a children's book here. Um, but I'm wanting to just wrap my own history, my own story in a fictional context um, in such a way that it would make some sense and, and, and involve them because their stories are involved in that story too. It's like a parable. It's true, it's just not real. Hmm. 11,000 copies sold in four months from a garage. Well, not only that, through that garage we shipped 1.2 million in 13 months with less than $300 in marketing and advertising. So it was a phenomenon that was grassroots from the very get-go. And uh, the people that came to the website, um, the two guys that created the publishing company, so I'm technically not self-published, but Wayne Jacobson and Brad Cummings are the publishing company, Windblown Media. And it they was, did this just to help you well, do they, this. Exactly, and, and they did it to, because 26 publishers turned us down. And half of them faith-based, half of them non-faith-based, the faith-based side saying, it's just too edgy for our constituents and the non-faith side saying it's just got too much Jesus in it. So mm. you got stuck between Jesus and edgy and, and they created Windblown and we pooled our resources which was Wayne had actually some savings and I had a friend and Brad had a Visa to MasterCard. <laughs> and we ordered 10,000 copies, they delivered 11,000. Brad and Wayne have a podcast called thegodjourney.com and through that we had pre-sold about 1,000 copies that went all over the world. And, and gave a bunch to our friends that generated uh, people coming to the simple website, which was the only place initially you could get it. And we were hoping through the first uh, two years to get through 10,000 copies. That was sort of a, a benchmark and maybe at some point to get to 100,000. 
so that we could have a conversation about a potential film or movie. And, and, uh, and in four months, we're running out of books because people are coming by and buying five and 10 and 20 and whatever. You've been surprised, at uh, least initially, this. Initially and every day and a dozen times a day. It's, it's a very surreal experience because less than a year ago, I'm still shipping out soldering tips and cleaning the toilet in the little manufacturer's rep warehouse in Clackamas, Oregon. And uh, so it's to say that this is a surprise is such an understatement. This is such a God thing from the very beginning. You know, I, I'm grateful that I had no idea what I was doing. You know, that I'm writing a gift for my children and that's all. Mm. And so there was, n there was no identity issue involved, no agenda behind it. And since nobody else is gonna read it, you know, I can do it any way that I want. Why do you think it's been such a hook? What, what felt need has this touched? Uh, you know, it, it hits people at a lot of different places, depending on what they bring to it. And I think uh, art and music and nature does that. It opens up space and invites you into a conversation and you get to bring your stuff to it. Um, I, I think religious systems, whether they're Christian religious systems or other kinds, there is a religion that is all about we need to, through performance, get to the affection of God, however you define God. And religion has promised relationship and forgiveness and love and integration and, and, and uh, authenticity, honesty um, for us, but it hasn't been able to deliver it. Mm -hmm. and, and what I'm trying to, to do for my children is to say, religion will never heal you and and that God has actually is opposed to religion in any sense he's introduced a relationship that is real living dynamic that we get invited into a relationship that already exists between father son and holy spirit the divine dance exactly yeah, yeah. baxter kruger's perichoresis you know the the dance of god and uh, something that's been un understood since the early church athanasius and the nicene creed and, and all of this so this is not unorthodox. People, people think that, you know, because of the imagery that is used inside of this, that uh, it's actually unorthodox, and it's not. Well, what most people have heard, and, and McLean's Magazine celebrated last September, God the Father looking like Aunt Jemima, but being referred to as Papa. Now that almost sounds schizophrenic, but, um, you know, you had me by page 93. I, I got it, that God has chosen in your story, sure. and it's a story, yeah. it's not a theological piece, yeah. but he has chosen to appear as yeah. and, you know, a black woman. Exactly, and imagery is always going to be inadequate because God is not male or female. And, uh, you know, I'm, this, is, this is a work of fiction, this is a novel. Your this mom was not... a little distressed though. Oh when yeah, she, first... she, she closed the book, called my sister and said, your brother's a heretic, you know. <laughs> But she got past that. It's a great story. But, um, um, and she's, very, she's comfortable with it now. Because God's not male or female. He's not 51% male, 49% female. All of maleness and femaleness are equally derived from the nature and character of God. And um, so to play with existing paradigms image-wise, you know, he's also not a burning bush. He's not a, a lion. Um, <laughs> Aslan. As, Aslan. <laughs> he's not. So imagery is always going to be inadequate, but it's ways that even in scripture, it helps us bridge into understanding the character Theophanies of nature. Theophanies and yeah. Christophanies. All, and all of them. And so even, even God coming into our humanity, you know, is, mm -hmm. is God coming to us in our lostness. And in the story, Mackenzie, he's lost. And he doesn't know how, and he's got an issue with his own father. And he's done what many of us have done. And we paint the face of God with the faces of our fathers or our absent fathers or um, ab abusive people in our lives or whatever. And, uh, and we just transfer that onto God. And so we think God is a schizophrenic. So the fatherhood of God is completely distorted by our personal experience. Well, and we want to define the fatherhood of God by our own experience, mm -hmm. as you're saying, rather than look. If you want to understand the fatherhood of God, look at Jesus. He's the one that says no one knows the Father. But if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I don't do anything unless I see the Father do it. That means everything He does, the, 
the gathering of the children, the touching of the leper, the, the, the healing of the woman caught in adultery, all of those things, that is the activity of the father. That is the heart of the father, the story of the prodigal son. That is a revolutionary story, and it, it's the one that, in a sense, got Jesus um, killed on the cross because he was introducing an idea of father that was so foreign to the religion. He was saying, it's about a relationship. Too intimate, oh, too personal. Way too intimate, When they way wouldn't too even personal. speak the name of God. Exactly. And the term father is only used 15 times in the entire Old Testament and never in a prayer. You know, so the absence there, all of a sudden, Jesus uses it 107 times, the Gospel of John 147 times, Matthew, Mark, and Luke 76 times. Mm -hmm. and, and you're going, there is something totally different here. Uh, Paul, and by the way, William P., you, you go by Paul. I do. Uh, you very much are Mac, the main character. Yeah, very much. The weekend Mackenzie spends. You, know, you have to remember always, I'm writing this for my children. This is trying to wrap my experience, my history into a story. And the